people joining us from the waiting room. Um, but we will go ahead and get started. Okay, again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Just a few housekeeping tasks and reminders to go over. Um, first, please keep your microphone on mute until the Q&A portions of the webinar. Um, if you do have questions at any time throughout the webinar, um, please type them in the chat and we'll get them answered. To, to find the chat in your Zoom window, look for the speaking bubble icon or the chat button. The chat defaults to all webinar participants um, or everyone in the to field. So to send a direct message to one individual, click the down arrow after everyone and select the specific participant. Um, next, if you need or want captions, you can enable these by finding the CC or show captions button at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you don't see the CC button, uh, look for the more icon um, with the three dots and click on that. And then from there, you'll be able to toggle the closed captions on or off. So today's webinar is Cleaning and Sanitizing Best Practices. This is the third webinar in the series Food Safety Foundations. In February, we discussed what pathogens need to grow. And in January, we discussed how food can become contaminated and nine pathogens that cause foodborne illness. If you were unable to join us for either of those, um, Diane is sharing a link to the recorded webinars in the chat. So my name is Amy Johnston and I am this evening's speaker. Um, I am a regional extension educator on our food systems team working in the area of food safety. I earned a bachelor's of science um, in dietetics from Michigan State University and a master's of science degree in public health nutrition from Case Western Reserve University. Um, additionally, I am a certified food production manager, certified HACCP, um, and GMP for food processors and manufacturers, and have completed a variety of other specialized food safety trainings. Um, and also with us this evening is Diane Seafeld, um, who's here to assist us with any technical difficulties. Um, you can direct message Diane in the Zoom chat if you're experiencing problems. Um, and also she will be sharing some links and resources throughout the, the webinar in the chat. So the topics we'll be covering today um, will be a deep dive into a sanitation routine. Um, we'll start with defining and discussing cleaning and detergents um, or soaps, and then we'll spend time on sanitizers, including how to make your own and test the concentration. And then we'll talk about and review the importance of a sanitation routine. Um, so whether you're joining us to benefit your food business or you just want to learn more, I hope you leave this webinar with increased confidence in your ability to prevent foodborne illness. Um, at the end of this webinar, you will understand the importance of each step in a sanitation routine and be able to explain it to others. Um, you'll know how to select and safely use sanitation chemicals. Um, and lastly, apply this new knowledge to a new or improved sanitation routine in your food business or at home. So why is a sanitation routine so important in your food business or, or home? So during the first two Food Safety Foundation webinars, we discussed how important safe food handling practices um, and a routine cleaning and sanitizing 
procedure are in preventing cross-contamination or the spread of pathogens from a contaminated source um, or surface to a food um, or other surface. Um, in this image, you can see a person is chopping peppers, they're wearing disposable gloves, um, and they're using a cutting board that was designed for cutting produce, um, and the space has been cleaned and sanitized before and during food preparation. A routine cleaning and sanitizing routine is also important in preventing the cross-contact of allergens. Cross-contact is the spread of an allergen to an allergy-free food. This contaminates the food with um, a chemical hazard. Remember back to January that allergens um, can be a, considered a chemical hazard if they're unlabeled um, and can make someone who is allergic to that um, ingredient sick. And lastly, a uh, routine sanitation procedure is critical in preventing the formation of biofilms. Um, so a biofilm is a invisible film <laughs> um, or protective barrier that microorganisms like bacteria that can cause foodborne illness can produce. Um, this biofilm protects them um, from conditions that, that can kill them. Um, so this illustration provides a simple overview of a biofilm. Um, first, the bacteria. Um, so this could be an example of Salmonella or E. coli um, or Staphylococcus aureus um, or any of the others we talked about um, contaminating a surface. Um, that surface can be a counter, um, part of an appliance like a mixer or a drawer handle. Um, and as we discussed in the February webinar, bacteria need a food and water source to grow. So in the second step, the bacteria are happy and growing because the surface has not been properly or routinely cleaned and sanitized. So once the bacteria get to a certain maturity, um, then that biofilm begins to grow. And that is the, the green bubble around the bacteria. And the bacteria will continue to grow and multiply and spread. And in the fourth step, the yellow dots represent um, cleaning and sanitizing. So the biofilm helps to adhere or keep the bacteria stuck to the surface. Um, and the sanitation steps are pretty much ineffective. So biofilms are estimated to be in, involved in about 60% um, of the world's um, foodborne illness outbreaks. Um, so because biofilms are so challenging to remove once they've formed, preventing their formation is, is critical. So having a routine, having and using a routine and proper cleaning and sanitizing um, procedure um, that uses chemicals safely um, is a really important step in preventing these bacteria from, from having access to, to food and water sources and then making these biofilms. So before we dive into discussing a sanitation routine, um, let's do a quick poll. Um, Diane's going to launch a uh, poll, um, how many steps or actions do you think are in a thorough sanitation routine? Okay, we got a mix going on. We've got some threes, five, seven. Good. No twos. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, great. So about half of you um, believe that there are five. Excellent. And you would be correct. Um, there are five steps in a thorough sanitation routine. Um, the first step is dry cleaning or removing any visible debris from the surface or the area. 
Then there is wet cleaning um, or washing with the detergent or soap. Then we have rinsing with clean water, then sanitizing the surface. Um, and then lastly, uh, letting that surface dry. Um, and that may look different depending on, on the chemical. So let's spend some time going through each of these steps in detail. So step one is dry cleaning. Um, dry cleaning is that removing of debris like crumbs, um, dust, dirt, or any other potential physical hazards from a surface. Um, so for counters or food production areas, you might wipe or brush away the debris into the trash. Um, if they're sticky or dried on residue, you might need to scrape it off as much as you can. Um, and then for floors, you would sweep or vacuum. Um, supplies or tools that you may need for dry cleaning include dry clean cloths or paper towels, a dry clean cloth that has not been used for other tasks is okay to use as long as, again, it has not been used um, for another task until it has been, been washed and dried. A rigid scraper might be useful to remove um, dried on residue like in an oven or on a stove top, um, but be mindful of the scraping edge. Um, as it starts to become worn, replace it so no material shards or pieces can get into the food um, or ingredients. So this is an example of a scraper um, that is approved for use on food contact surfaces. It's made of a polypropylene material and it has no seams. Um, so bacteria can't get stuck in a little crevice, which makes it resistant to bacteria growth. And it's available in a variety of colors, which helps you to see if any shards came off um, during use. So again, just an example of one type of product that, that could be helpful. And then keep rooms and vacuums in good repair by cleaning the bristles and the filters regularly. So why is dry cleaning an important step in the sanitation routine? Um, it's because dry cleaning or removing of those visible debris really increases the effectiveness of the wet cleaning, which is the next step, um, because it reduces the number of um, particles um, that could get trapped in a cleaning cloth um, in the soap or get into the soapy water and then get spread around um, throughout the rest of wet cleaning. Um, so before we, we jump into to wet cleaning, um, are there any questions about um, dry cleaning in the chat? Or None that have come in. Okay. So next is wet cleaning. Um, wet cleaning is using a detergent or soap um, warm water solution to loosen and remove physical, chemical, and biological hazards from a surface. Um, so physical hazards can be those debris or food crumbs um, that pathogens need to grow. Um, chemical hazards can include allergens um, and biological hazards um, can include those illness causing pathogens. So in combinations with the ingredients in the, the detergent or the soap, the, the act or the motion of scrubbing is important to loosen up the hazards from the surface. So use a clean cleaning cloth. Um, again, that cloth should be washed and dried before using again. Um, avoid the use of sponges because bacteria can hide in the material if not properly cleaned and sanitized. Um, thin scouring pads like the one on the screen um, can be useful um, because they can um, create some good friction when scrubbing and because they're thin, um, they're very easily cleaned, sanitized and dried very quickly. Um, so those are, those are a, a good option. 
um, mix a detergent or soap with warm water in a bucket or container. Um, a green pail is, is a good example or a best practice that can be used um, as the green pail is specifically labeled for um, a soap solution for cleaning, um, so it would not be confused with any other purposes. Um, and these pails can come in a variety of sizes from three quarts, six quarts or larger. So depending on your food business needs, um, one of these might, might work well for you. To select a detergent or soap, um, check the label to verify it is safe for um, or approved for food contact surfaces. Um, you don't want to use um, a hand soap or an automotive soap um, for cleaning food preparation surfaces um, and equipment because the active ingredients might not be effective or um, they're unsafe for um, consumption. So the active ingredients in detergents or soap may include a combination of these that you see on the screen. And this is because each of these ingredients are effective on different surfaces and different types of debris. So for example, surficants are in detergents or soaps um, because they promote that foaming um, or the suds that penetrate and loosen debris from the surface. Um, sodium or potassium hydroxide are good at breaking down fats or oils so they can be removed from the surface. Um, salts and acids will react with proteins and starches or carbohydrates differently. And enzymes, which are those chemicals that usually end in that ASES, um, are typically more environmentally friendly. So you may see a combination of these ingredients in, in a product that you're using. So when purchasing a detergent or soap, um, you can use a ready to use product um, or a concentrate that needs to be mixed with water. Uh, mix according to the manufacturer instructions. Um, the instructions should tell you how much of the detergent or soap to add to the water. Unfortunately, there are many products that won't have this information directly on the label, um, but as, instead they might have a product website listed with a statement for more information. Um, I was actually, I forget what I was looking at just the other day. I was, they didn't have the um, instructions on there, but they had a teeny tiny QR code, but the QR code was too small that my camera wasn't picking it up. So sometimes um, even those aren't, aren't the greatest um, way to communicate. Um, so another resource that is available is um, the website called Smart Label. It's by the Consumer Brands Association. Um, and Diane is sharing the link in the chat. Um, and from the homepage, you can click product search and then type in the product information and review the results there. So it'll give you all of the, the information you need to handle that, that um, product safely. So it's important to follow the mixing instructions as too little detergent or soap to, um, to the water ratio might not be effective in removing debris and too much detergent or soap um, to the water ratio could lead to scale or build up on surfaces. And while there's not a set temperature definition of warm water, it's typically about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, cold water may decrease the ability of the detergent or soap to form um, to form form a foam or suds. And too hot of water can change the effectiveness of some of the ingredients and just make it also very difficult to handle. Um, and then lastly, do not store the cleaning cloth or a scouring pad in a soapy um, water solution between use, uses. Um, detergents and soaps are designed to remove pathogens, not kill them. Um, so keeping a cloth in the water um, is just kind of that ideal environment for, for some bacteria to, to grow and, and stay on those cleaning cloths. 
Okay. Um, so the naming of detergents and soaps for cleaning food contact surfaces can be confusing um, because some might be called an all-purpose cleaner. Um, so read the label and the use description carefully to make sure it's safe for food contact surfaces um, and for cleaning. Um, be cautious of categories of industrial cleaners or degreasers, um, as these might be for, um, again, automotive or machinery and not for food surfaces. Um, so these could damage the surface um, or leave a chemical residue that could contaminate food. So these are just some products that can be, be used for both um, cleaning. Um, so again, re read that label and description carefully. Okay. So why is wet cleaning an important part of a sanitation routine? Um, because wet cleaning removes the hazards um, from the surface, so the sanitizer solution can then kill and reduce um, the number of any remaining pathogens to, to a safe level. So dry cleaning and wet cleaning um, should not be skipped. Um, they're an important step before sanitizing an area. Any questions about wet cleaning before we um, just touch on rinsing? None have come in. Okay. So after wet cleaning, it's important to rinse the surface or equipment with clean water. Um, this will remove any detergent or soap solution that's left in that, that area. So use a clean cloth and water. Do not use the same cloth um, that you used um, for, for the wet cleaning. Um, and avoid using a container that once held chemicals to store or to um, put your, your clean water in as that kind of container could leach um, chemicals into, into the water. So use a container that has not held chemicals in the past. Um, oh, and I already mentioned, do not use that, that same cloth um, that was used for, for cleaning as that could just re-recontaminate the, the whole area. Again, so, so why is it important to not skip the rinse step? Um, because it's important because if you were to mix the detergent or the soap solution with the sanitizer solution, um, you would, could be changing the, the concentration of the sanitizer solution, which could then make it no longer um, as effective in, in killing those pathogens. Okay, so next up is going to be sanitizing. Okay. So sanitizing is the use of a sanitizer solution to kill or reduce the number of pathogens to a safe level um, to minimize the risk of contamination and foodborne illness. So the requirement by the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration is that a sanitizer must achieve a five log reduction for food contact surfaces and a three log reduction for non-food contact surfaces. So for a log reduction, think back to our discussion about time as a factor for pathogen growth. Remember the log phase is when bacteria are rapidly growing. So a sanitizer is stopping this rapid growth. Um, a one log reduction means reducing the number of pathogens that are present by 90%. So a five log reduction means reducing the number of pathogens present by 99.999%. Um, we'll never achieve 100%, so this is, this is pretty darn close. So that is the standard for, for food contact surfaces. Um, there are ready to use or pre-mixed sanitizer solutions, um, as well as sanitizer concentrates that need to be mixed with water uh, before use. 
So with mixing a sanitizer solution, a general rule, rule of thumb is to use room temperature water. Um, and this, this is because that temperature generally does not um, negatively affect the, the active chemical ingredients. Um, additionally, water hardness um, and the pH of your water can have an impact on the concentration or effectiveness of a sanitizer. Um, so most water sources have a pH of anywhere between 5 to 8.5, so pretty in that, in that neutral-ish range. Um, so if your, your water has a, a pH that is outside of that range, or if your water is very hard, um, a ready to use or a pre-mix sanitizer solution might be a better option. Um, if you're mixing or transferring a ready to use sanitizer to a spray bottle, um, make sure to label it with the chemical name and date it um, with the date that that solution was made um, because the sanitizer can lose effectiveness over time. And then similar to the green pail we talked about in the wet cleaning, um, there are red pails that are specifically labeled for sanitizer solution. So it's a good visual cue or indicator that this is the intended purpose of, of this chemical. Um, if you're using a pail or another container, um, because it's open or exposed to air um, and you're dipping the cleaning cloth into the solution, um, the concentration is going to, to change over time and, and with use. So um, a, again, a, a general rule of thumb is to test and replace every four hours, but again, that depends on um, the use of it. Um, there are a variety of sanitizer solutions available, including chlorine-based, which is sometimes referred to as a bleach solution, um, quaternary ammonium compounds or quats, um, iodophers or iodine-based solutions, um, and peroxides, which can have either or both um, hydrogen peroxide or pair oxyacetic acid. Um, and then there's also thermal ways of sanitizing. I frequently get asked if vinegar is an approved or an effective sanitizer. Um, and while zin <laughs> vinegar um, is acetic acid, um, acetic acid by itself it has not been shown to kill enough or get that five log reduction of all pathogens. Um, so you might see it as an ingredient in some cleaners or sanitizers. Um, however, but on its own, um, it, like I said, it, it cannot, it has not been shown to get that five log reduction of all pathogens. Um, So chlorine-based sanitizers are common and can be very cost-effective. Um, you can purchase a ready-to-use solution or mix your own. If you're mixing your own chlorine-based um, solution using bleach, um, also mix this with room temperature water and add the bleach to the water as both of those um, actions can help reduce any vapors um, that might get created, um, which can be really irritating to, to inhale. The concentration range of a chlorine-based sanitizer is um, between 50 and 100 uh, ppm, which stands for parts per million. So it's just that active, um, how much of the active ingredient is in your, your water solution. Um, so that 50 to 100 ppm is effective in killing pathogens um, when it has one minute of contact time. So in that one minute of contact time, you're going to get that five log reduction on food contact surfaces. At 
This concentration of 50 to 100, um, the area does not need a, a rinse afterwards. It does not need to be rinsed with water. Um, if the concentration is greater, um, so sometimes you might see a recommendation of 200 parts per million of a chlorine-based solution on food contact surfaces. Um, that's fine, but then that area does need a clean water rinse afterwards. Um, so again, 50 to 100, one minute of contact time, no rinse required. Um, so to ensure you have the correct concentration, it's best to use the chlorine test strips. Um, so testing the solution is really important um, because too little or too much can have negative effects. Um, if you're going to be um, really busy in your production space for several hours, you know, a bucket might be a good good use. Um, otherwise, spray bottles are also a good way to, to store this solution. And again, because a bucket is open to air and your cloth is going to be dipped into that solution, the concentration is going to change over time and with use. Um, so in a spray bottle, the solution um, generally lasts anywhere from seven to 10 days, depending on the bottle. Um, but again, so it's best to test the concentration before each use. Um, and then when making a new solution, do not combine old and new solution. Dispose of the old and make a new, um, new mix. <laughs> Um, when selecting a bleach, um, not all be bleach products will work. Um, do not use a chlorine that's intended for pool use um, and do not use a bleach um, that's solely designed for laundry. Use a plain unscented non-gel bleach. Um, the active ingredient, ingredient in bleach is sodium hypochlorite, um, and that's the ingredient that's getting measured um, by the test strips. Um, so there are a variety of bleach concentrations out there um, for purchase. Um, so on the screen, you'll see a guide that is a good starting point to mixing your, your solution, just so you don't waste product. Like if you were to accidentally dump too much bleach into your water um, and you couldn't get it diluted enough, you know, you would have to um, discard of that. So again, this is a, a starting point um, to, to know what ratio to use. Again, only use plain unscented bleach and then test your concentration afterwards with a test strip. And you want to be in that 50 to 100 ppms. So to find the concentration of sodium hypochlorite, um, you need to find the active ingredient label on the, on the bottle, which can be in different place depending on the bottle. Um, so here's a good example of a Clorox bleach with a sodium hypochlorite concentrate of 7.5%. Um, so the chart that I just showed you, um, you know, that didn't have 7.5% um, listed on there. Um, so again, this is why using the test strips is um, such a good way to ensure that you're getting that, that right concentration. The next most common sanitizer is a quat um, or a quaternary ammonium compound. Um, so depending on the quat solution, um, the concentration needed for a five log reduction could vary between 150 to 440 um, ppm, or that parts per million. So again, read the manufacturer instructions carefully. Um, 200 ppm is, is a fairly common concentration. Um, the use of test strips is very important um, for quat solutions. The test strips that would be used would be the QT40 um, or the QT146. 
So these are not the same test strips that you would use for the chlorine solution. So I tried to highlight um, with arrows um, where you can see the different names um, or the intended use of, of the different test strips. A um, little fun fact about test strips that um, sometimes people don't know is that all test strips do have an expiration date. Um, it's either on the back or the side of the package in tiny print um, because their accuracy will decrease over time. So these are some examples of some quat sanitizers. Um, some of these, such as the 3M product, um, requires a rinse for food contact surfaces after use. So again, remember to read the manufacturer instructions. One, to know what concentration you're, you're trying to get. And then two, to know um, if you let it air dry or if there is a, a rinse afterwards. Next is idofurs, um, which are commonly used. Um, they're not. They're not. Com they're not that commonly used um, unless the temperature of the solution can be um, carefully controlled. Um, the The water really needs to main be maintained in a tight window um, because at, at temperatures over a hundred, slightly over a hundred degrees Fahrenheit, um, the chemical um, will start to vaporize. So it's useful in low temperature applications. Um, the concentration can range between 12.5 to, to 25 parts per million um, and has a one minute of contact time. Um, so again, they have different test strips um, that are specifically for these types of sanitizer solutions. Um, a downside of iodine-based sanitizers is that they can cause staining on, on some surfaces. This is, are just a couple examples of concentrates that would need to be mixed um, into a solution for use. And then lastly, peroxide-based sanitizer solutions. Um, there are two active ingredients in these sanitizer solutions, um, hydrogen peroxide or HP. Um, can be used in a sanitizer solution, but a, a high concentration is needed. Um, that concentration of HP uh, really needs to be 5% or greater. So um, like handling it with care um, so it doesn't cause any irritation. Um, and it does have some limited application in food contact areas. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> peroxyacetic acid or PAA, um, it can have a strong odor, almost vinegar-like, which makes sense because PAA is made um, from a reaction um, between hydrogen peroxide and acetic acid, um, which is vinegar. So you sometimes we'll see um, HP or PAA um, in some more, um, quote unquote, more natural um, type sanitizer solutions. Um, and there are uh, specific test strips for, for these as well. So again, um, so here's an example you can see on the screen um, of a hydrogen peroxide that's 35%. Um, so again, extreme care must be taken when handling and mixing. Um, follow the manufacturer's instructions for mixing the solution. Because there's so many different concentrations of hydrogen peroxide, um, out there. I don't have a handy um, formula chart um, as, a, as a starting point like we do for the, the bleach solutions. Um, it really comes down to reading the label, making sure it's safe for food contact surfaces, and then following the, the mixing instructions. And then again, here's an example of what's 
considered a more natural product um, that seventh, seventh generation, um, which does have hydrogen peroxide um, as an active ingredient. Um, you can see the name of it is kind of confusing. It says a disinfecting cleaner. Um, so really reading the manufacturer instructions to see if it's safe for food contact services and what the intended use of this chemical is, um, is really important. For all sanitizers, the concentration is important. More does not equal better or more effective. Um, too high of a concentration can damage the surfaces, which can make contamination um, and buildup of films easier in the future. So follow the use of instructions and, and test those concentrations. Um, again, uh, the concentration can decrease over time. Um, because of evaporation from an open container or from use with dipping a cloth into that solution. So again, remember to test it frequently and replace it um, as needed. And then for spray bottles, um, test before each use um, and label and date the, the bottle. <laughs> And then for equipment or utensils that can be submerged in water and you don't want to use a chemical, um, thermal sanitizing can be an appropriate option. Um, hot water can be used if the temperature is maintained at um, a very hot temperature, 171 degrees Fahrenheit or higher throughout the entire um, process. So the temperature can't drop when you um, add a cold or room temperature piece of equipment. It needs to be maintained um, a lot of times mechanically at that, that hot temperature. Um, the equipment or the utensil must be fully submerged for at least 30 seconds and then air dried to prevent any recontamination. Um, for mechanical dishwashers in an inspected kitchen space, there are both chemical or high heat temp temperature options. Um, a high temperature dishwasher has requirements for a final rinse. Um, so like a stationary rack must be at least 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and all others, like a conveyor belt um, or a multiple tank, must be um, at 180 degrees Fahrenheit um, or higher. So for home food businesses, um, like cottage foods, um, many newer dishwashers also have a sanitizer setting. Um, so you can use that feature to sanitize um, items that you put into your dishwasher. Um, so follow the manufacturer instructions on your specific model. Um, and steam is also an option in certain food processing places. Um, um, but it does have to be limited to, to certain equipment or spaces um, because there are requirements for monitoring um, the contact time and the temperature of the steam. So not, not commonly used in the, the type of businesses or applications we're, we're talking about. So documentation of the sanitizer solution is a best practice and it might be required in some inspected food businesses. So this is an example of what a log could look like. Um, a few key points are always list the type of sanitizer solution and then include the target concentration so you don't have to remember what you're trying to get to um, when you check that, that solution. And this just makes um, less room for error. And then document your results. You can do a similar log for documentation for hot water sanitizing. Again, include the target you are reaching and then show how frequently you are monitoring the temperature. So how do you know if the sanitizer you are using is safe? 
um, first read the for use instructions um, to check to make sure that it's safe for food contact surfaces. And then regardless of the type of sanitizer solution you are using, it must meet the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency um, and state approvals. Um, so the EPA reviews toxicity data and results from tests to determine if the sanitizer solution is safe and effective. So meeting that five log reduction um, and then there and then approves it. Um, you can search the EPA database. Um, Diana's going to share a link in the chat. Um, so you can just simply enter your product name and, and search and it'll come up if it is an approved um, solution by the EPA. Um, then each state uh, um, registers and approves sanitizers. Um, and Diane's gonna share another link in the chat. Um, and this is for a national database that um, the majority of states um, do use or participate in and Minnesota does. Um, so again, you can search this database then to make sure it is a, an approved um, sanitizer in, in Minnesota. On each sanitizer, um, the EPA um, is kind of giving its stamp of approval um, that the sanitizer um, solution will perform um, how it is described on the label when it is prepared properly. Um, so in the black box is an example of an EPA registration number. It's that EPA um, REG dot NO dot 5813-120. It's usually very, very tiny. Um, you kind of have to maybe hunt for it sometimes. Um, but that, if you see that EPA registration number on a product, you know that it has been um, declared safe and effective um, when handled properly by, by the EPA. Um, if you don't see the EPA registration number on a label, um, stop using that item until you can get the information you need. You can contact the manufacturer and request the EPA number um, or um, another site within the, the EPA um, is this label lookup. Um, you can um, go to this site and Diane will share the link in the chat and you can search for um, the, the label and the registration number of the product that you're using. Um, if you see these kind of icons on a package, it is not a substitution for the EPA registration number. Um, these just mean different things. Um, so a USDA certified bio-based product that's talking about how um, some of the ingredients um, behave um, when they um, dissolve um, NSF. That's we're talking about equipment, um, types of materials and how it can be cleaned and sanitized. Um, the EPA safer product standards that's um, just a choice-based um, program within um, the EPA. And then the FDA, the GRASS approved, that means um, generally, generally recognized as safe. So none of these are a substitution for an EPA registration number. Similar words like organic or natural, those are not a substitute for the EPA registration number. This is a screenshot of what that state database um, looks like. So you can see the states with the stars are the ones that participate. Um, in the drop down, you can select the state. So I put it to Minnesota. Um, and then you can either search by the company, um, the EPA registration number, or an active ingredient if you're trying to find uh, an approved um, 
product with a certain ingredient in the state. Okay, so any questions about um, sanitizing before we, we go to our last step? We did have one question. How do you make sure water is room temperature? That's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, a general easy way is make sure you're, um, if you have just um, the one temperature control um, for your faucet, um, have it right there in the middle. Um, or if you have a hot and a cold, um, try to have those um, even. Um, and then you can also just take the temperature of the water. If you have a food thermometer at home, you can use a food thermometer to take the temperature of the water, fill a glass, um, put your thermometer in there and wait 15 seconds. And the temperature that it reads um, would then be the temperature of your water. Good question. Okay. So our last step is, is drying. So some products um, will require a rinse after you sanitize, others will not. Some will say to wipe dry, some will not, some will say to air dry. Um, so it's really important to, again, follow those manufacturer instructions and, um, and read those labels. Uh, if if a chemical is required or calling for a rinse afterwards, it is because um, you know that that chemical has not completely um, evaporated or vaporized, um, and it needs to be removed from from that surface. Um, again, pay attention to contact time um, to make sure you're you're letting everything do um, have enough time to do its job. Um, and if you do have to do a rinse and a manual drying, use clean water and use a clean cloth or a paper towel. So those are the steps in a sanitation routine. Um, and before we wrap up, we'll just talk about how often different surfaces or pieces of equipment should be cleaned and sanitized. So before and after each use, you want to um, clean and sanitize things like counters, sinks, um, especially after handling raw meats or before washing produce, um, stoves and, and other cooking equipment. Any of those really high contact um, areas, you're, you're going to want to um, clean and sanitize um, after each use, because this is where cross-contamination and cross-contact um, can really occur quite easily. Daily, um, you wanna do like handles on drawers or refrigerator or freezer doors, um, soap dispensers, anything that is again, um, pretty high contact um, and has the potential for multiple people touching it um, or touching it very frequently throughout um, um, your food preparation time. Weekly, you want to do things like inside refrigerators, making sure that um, if there's a if there's a spill in a refrigerator or a freezer, clean it up right away. Um, but if for general routine maintenance, you want to clean and sanitize um, those on a weekly basis. And then as needed, um, you know, mixers, handheld equipment, you would clean and sanitize those after use um, and store them appropriately so they're not going to um, get contaminated. Um, and then you know, if they're sitting out on a counter, keep them covered um, and then clean them as needed in between uses. And same with shelving. Um, if there's spills or debris, clean those up. Otherwise, um, put them on a routine, routine cleaning and sanitizing routine. Um, we do have a couple of resources to share with you, and Dan, um, Diane will put these in the chat. Um, first is a food business fact sheet from the Minnesota Department of Health, um, and it can be helpful for you um, 
for those of you that are processing food in an inspected kitchen space. Um, and then also my colleagues at Purdue University Extension developed a handout called um, Considerations for Using uh, a Sanitizer at Home. So Diane will be sharing those links with you. Um, are there any um, new or additional questions? None have come in. Okay. Um, well, then thank you all for attending this evening. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback on today's webinar. Um, this evaluation should only take just a couple minutes to complete. Um, your responses are anonymous and they're used to help guide future programs. Um, so you can either scan the QR code or um, follow the link. And the evaluation um, will be active for about a week. And then um, uh, to continue to participate in these webinars, um, you can go to the link on the screen or scan the QR code. Um, next month, we will talk about getting prepared to preserve. Um, it, it, we're offering that webinar at two different times in the month of April. Um, it'll be the same content at both. Um, and then in May, we will start to apply everything that we have learned in the first four um, webinars to a different food preservation technique um, throughout the spring and summer and fall months. So again, thank you all. Um, if there are any questions, um, we do have a few minutes left and I'm happy to stay on to answer those. But other than that, I hope you enjoy your evening.